Now let us see what is an oncogene. In so oncogenes are thus altered versions of proto-oncogenes or genes that code for the signaling molecules. The oncogenes activate signaling cascades continuously resulting in increased production of factors that will stimulate growth. For instance, MYC which is a proto-oncogene, every time a cell goes through a cell cycle gets stimulated for division, MYC is activated. This codes for a transcription factor. Now, if there are mutations in MYC which convert it to oncogene, this will become a cancer producing event and in a large number of cancers, severity of the cancers or even 70 percent of the cancers are associated with MYC alteration in some way or other. MYC is a nuclear effector. Now, let us look at another protein which is a protein tyrosine kinase. What does it do? It will phosphorylate another protein thereby activating it. Now, for example, the first oncogene that was discovered in 1970 was called as SARC, SRC, but pronounced as SARK, SARC. This was first dis discovered as an oncogene in a chicken retrovirus. That brings me to another issue that sometimes RNA viruses which are causing to DNA tumor, which are causing tumors, these are called as retroviruses, carry counterparts of cellular oncogenes and they are altered, modified and when you, when a person or animal gets infected with these viruses, in fact, this, there are many examples of retroviruses working in animals, they transform these cells. So, they convert a normal cell into a cancerous cell. In 1976, Michael Bishop and Harold Warmus of University of California, San Francisco demonstrated that oncogenes were nothing else but defective proto-oncogenes. They are part and parcel of our normal cell. They only when they are altered, modified, they become oncogenics. For this discovery, Bishop and Warmus were awarded the Nobel Prize in the, the year uh, 1989. Now, Another such oncogene which is found very often in a large number of human tumors is called as the RAS oncogene. This protein sits on the membrane, it interacts with several other proteins, so it really has many partners and it is involved in um, as a major on off switch in a signaling pathway. Now normally what it does is that it regulates the cell growth. So, it senses the signal on the outside, communicates with a large number of proteins and effectively results in stimulating the cell growth. About 30 percent of the tumors including lung tumor, colon tumor, thyroid tumor, pancreatic carcinomas all have mutations in the RAS oncogene. The conversion of proto-oncogene to an oncogene may happen because of a mutation in the proto-oncogene. It may happen because rearrangements of the genes take place or it may increase the number of copies of these proteins. Sometimes a virus may integrate near an oncogene or a near a proto-oncogene and stimulate its expression and because of this insertion also it has been found that you can get tumors. This figure nicely depicts how the retroviruses can cause tumors. Just notice here that they have the LTRs, the GAC, pol and envelope. Within them they sometimes carry a tumor gene or an oncogene and this when the virus infects the cell, this RNA becomes DNA, it gets integrated in the genome and converts a normal cell into a cancer cell and thus the cancer causing viruses which are very popularly known as retroviruses or the RNA tumor viruses cause cell transformation. Now, just to sum up, the mechanisms which convert a normal proto-oncogene into oncogene can be quickly summarized as follows. You could have a mutation in a gene or an alteration in a gene which results in a change in the protein. It could lead to inactivation of a regulatory protein whereby resulting in the partner being more active. It could result because of a translocation or rearrangement in the chromosomes or genes. It may result because of amplification and this has been observed in case of homogeneously staining regions, MYC, many other oncogenes. It may be because of a deletion which regulates the gene again and thereby you have increased expression of the genes. 
you may have altered protein expression or expression at the wrong time or at the wrong place of a regulatory protein. I must also mention here that a very important aspect of cancer is the chromosome instability. Errors in replication, errors in repair and instability of the chromosomes is another very typical characteristic feature of almost all cancers. The analogy of the car and the brake can now be looked at that if you have that the accelerator cannot be controlled, but once you press it, it continues to stay in a press situation, the car is going to move very fast and in the same fashion, the cell will continue to divide presence of an oncogene in a germ line results in an inherited predisposition for tumors. Let me just spend a minute here. We talked about a somatic change which change in a somatic cell in our body cell which results in cancer. But let us imagine a scenario where a particular person inherits such a mutation from his or her parents in a hereditary fashion. Then one change which is required is already present. So, the number of steps required for converting such a cell into a cancer cell are reduced and as a result we say that this individual is predisposed to cancer okay? and therefore, a single oncogene is not enough to give you a cancer. So, it is not that such an individual is definitely going to get cancer, but compared to 10 other people who do not have such a change in their gene, a person who has a mutation in the gene is more likely to get cancer. Now, let us look at other category of things which are called as gain of function mutations. So, most oncogenes are dominant mutations, a single copy of the gene can convert a cell into a high level of growth and uh, we have already seen that it alters growth regulation. So, many of these are actually either growth factors themselves or they can be growth factor receptors two genes which have been very well worked out in case of breast and ovarian cancer are called as BRCA1 and BRCA2 and these were discovered in 1994 and 95 and these susceptibility genes account for about 25 percent of the breast cancer or ovarian cancer. There are of course, other genes which have been discovered like CHEK2 and so on. Now, as we have already seen that you can have receptor tyrosine kinases which work at the cell surface which also give you a cancer. Let us look at this figure which tells you how from a normal chromosome if you lose one allele you can have cancer and in this you have a healthy cell, there is an injury or a mutation, genetic errors accumulate and you are converting this cell into a cancer whereby you have a cancerous phenotype. The second important set of genes are called as the tumor suppressor genes which are the negative regulators of growth. I already mentioned them to you. These genes normally inhibit cell growth and thereby prevent tumor formation. So, they are kind of guardians of genomes or guardians of the cell regulation. Now, if you mutate these then the regulation is not going to be there and the cell is going to show uncontrolled growth. A whole lot of tumor suppressor genes have been identified today and they can act at the cell surface, they can act in the cytoplasm or they can ask, act in the nucleus. Mutations in them are recessive because if you have a good copy of the regulator, it still functions. For example, if you have two brakes, even if one brake fails, you can still control the car with the second brake. So, this means that the trait is not exp expressed unless both copies are mutated. Using this uh, analogy, this is called as loss of heterozygosity and this is one way you can actually detect the diagnose, diagnose the cancer or the predisposition. How is it that both genes get mutated? I mean, when you have one mutation, you inherit a predisposition. It has been observed that if one mutation is already present in the egg cell or the sperm cell, then it will be present in all cells of an animal body. Now, because this mutation is recessive, it is not expressed, but somehow this predisposes the cell to have a higher rate of mutation and because of which you can, you have an example, classical example of hereditary uh, predisposition is a retinoblastoma which is an eye tumor and it is seen that in families where you have retinoblastoma, the frequency is much much higher and not only that such an individual will be likely to get not only RB tumor, but many other tumors. In fact, there is more than a 50 percent possibility of developing such a tumor if you have a defective retinoblastoma gene. About 90 percent of the genes who uh, individuals who will receive this defective copy will have this mutation in the second copy and therefore, young children will develop this disease. 
another such family so there has been a concept of what is called as cancer families unfortunately you do find that there are certain families where they have a higher predisposition to cancer and today with the advent of technology it is possible for you to do early diagnosis of at least this predisposition and take appropriate care by controlling diet and other stress factors now these there are two other examples of this which i would like to discuss with you one is called as familial adenomatous polyps or colon cancer fpc and apc where also both brca2 and brca1 we have seen in uh, breast and ovarian cancer there are several such examples where a particular gene and mutations in it are in a tumor suppressor gene why is it called as a tumor suppressor gene if it's functioning normally you don't have tumors when it is function is lost it gives you a cancerous phenotype having a mutation in one predisposes you to get more mutations and therefore the environmental factors will result in more and more mutations in the somatic cell now it was nudson who proposed this two hit hypothesis where if you don't have any mutation you need to have at least two events but if you one uh, already has a mutation then only one event is sufficient to convert a cell into a cancerous cell the third category of genes which are very important are called as dna repair genes and in colon cancer the classical example of mismatch repair gene is very famous normally when dna replicates the mistakes are corrected now if you do not have a way of correcting these mistakes you are going to accumulate more and more mutations and thereby resulting in damage another such disease is called as xeroderma pigmentosum where the individuals are very sensitive to uv light and they have a thousand fold increase in incidence of skin cancer okay so they already have a problem in relation to repair of uv damage and they are much more uh, susceptible to skin cancers the xp gene when uh, mutated or there is another gene like uh, in bloom syndrome where also if the dis the gene blm or the uh, blm gene which is the bloom syndrome gene if it's mutated then there are very high frequencies of chromosome breaks chromosome rearrangements and such individuals unfortunately have an increased risk of lung disease diabetes and many different types of cancers thus cancer research has focused largely on understanding how the normal cell works how its growth and development is regulated and how by a set of genetic changes you can convert it into a cancer cell a number of genes in fact a large set of genes have been identified studied cloned characterized and these the processes which lead to initiation progression and subsequent development into metastasis uh, are being very nicely and elegantly worked out and obviously there are certain changes which are happening without any prior history there are certain changes which have a predisposition and therefore it is said that these cancers where which are because of the predisposition we call that there is an inheritance uh, which is passed on from the parents to children so now we can talk of two types of genetic changes one which are passed on from generation to generation and other which are in your cells or somatic cells which are not passed on to the next generation if there is a germline mutation it is going to be passed down in the family if it's a new mutation that you have acquired then it's not going to be passed on so if you carry a predisposition then definitely such a person is more likely to be susceptible to cancer it has been seen that in breast cancer in ovarian cancer in lung cancer in colon cancer even in some cases of prostate pancreatic testicular cancer there definitely is a predisposition what is the advantage of all this understanding by using novel tools and technologies which are being developed like pcr in situ hybridization chromosome painting uh, laser confocal screening you can identify and detect the change that has taken place in the gene even before the cancer can manifest itself now some of the genetic disorders where you can have a high rate of cancer are leaf raumeni syndrome multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 
neurofibromatosis, retinoblastoma. So, if somebody in the family has had any of these diseases, the chance that member of these family are more susceptible to cancer is definitely very high. The risk for cancer is definitely very high. However, you may spend all your life without ever getting a cancer. Please look at this cancer family and notice here that because both parents are carriers, you can see that certain individuals for two generations have consistently had a higher chance of getting cancer. But note at the same time that a large number of siblings do not have the cancer. So, it is essentially a question of multi-step, maintaining a balance. And this picture also illustrates to you, this slide illustrates to you how protein modifications, DNA damage, apoptosis, cell growth and regulation is very coordinately regulated in disease progression and cancer. Look at this beautiful slide which illustrates to you chromosome painting which can be used for disease diagnosis, also diagnosis of cancer. You will notice here that normally each chromosome should have one color, but you will see here that because of translocations a number of chromosomes have two colors and that is because two parts of two chromosomes have come together here and this takes just a little while to do the diagnosis. Uh, this actually illustrates to you this particular slide, what is the frequency of different cancers and this analysis has been taken from the United States and you can see that a large proportion of cancers in United States are lung and bronchial, then followed by breast and then colon. Knowing about the genes which are responsible for cancers like the tumor suppressors, like the oncogenes, like the DNA repair gene, then helps us define, understand what is the genetic basis of cancer, why, what biochemical, physiological and molecular changes are responsible for causing the cancer. It helps definitely in the predisposition diagnosis. When the child is born or if anybody in the family has got a cancer, it may become possible very soon to at least find out whether you have even a small risk of getting a cancer. You must remember however, this does not mean that one will get cancer because it is only a predisposition which is inherited. It definitely can help you al sound an alarm and help you to modify your lifestyle, uh, change your nutritional intakes and take care of your antioxidants because they are also known to be very important free radicals and other materials are important in stimulating carcinogenesis. In efficient diagnosis, treatment, follow up and prognosis such markers will help in a major way. <coughs> it that is the knowing the genetic knowledge about what is the change in a particular individual. It helps you to classify cancers. It can tell you whether it is type 1, type 2, how much progress is made in this cancer tissue, how should you treat it? Is it going to be radiation resistant? Is it going to be resistant to the chemotherapeutic agents that you are going to use? And this is becoming better and better with more understanding of the genetic basis of cancer. Just look at this picture here which illustrates the breast cancer and it will tell you that the kind of genes and the gene regulated in it, you notice here that there are more than 25 genes which are involved and there is a lot of interlinking just illustrating this. Let me just come to the uh, kind of a summary of what we have been talking about. We have seen that there is indeed a genetic basis to cancer. We have tried to like take a look at what are the different types of changes in the gene and what kind of genes would result in cancer. Now, let us just see how exactly we can proceed from here. So, that means you could use PCR, chromosome painting, fluorescent in situ hybridization, microarrays, laser confocal, n number of these techniques which are available today including DNA sequencing to diagnose cancer to predict if a particular individual is going to have cancer. There is a lot of work going on with hopes uh, very high that it may be possible to have a cancer vaccine one day. You can develop new avenues of treatment because when you know the basis which is the reason why you are having a particular cancer, what is defective in this individual, then you can give therapies accordingly in a targeted fashion. Obviously, it makes possible early detection because even in a single cell, in a few cells you are able to detect and diagnose. So, better diagnosis and treatment is an offshoot of this understanding. One can use molecular and cytogenetic approaches to classify, categorize and give guidelines. And today, 
um, by environmental and nutrition and management, I already mentioned lifestyle changes and by using a whole lot of novel technologies, it may be possible to have a much better cure or at least management of cancer. Uh, I think this sort of sums up a very exciting area which is the genetics or heredity of cancer. Thank you very much.